Good afternoon, everyone. Vlad, uh, I have realized that it's very hard to stand between people and their lunch. But it seems today we are in that, um, in that enviable, in, unenviable position. But if all of you are intrigued by three numbers, what does it take to create a company that has north of $30 billion in valuation, north of 30 million customers, and north of 30 countries in which they are present, and do all of that in a short period of eight odd years, then this is really the panel where uh, we can dig deep into the minds of, of Vlad and, and understand what the journey has been like. We are, Vlad, as we discussed uh, earlier as well, we are going to keep this discussion focused on three critical areas, but we will try and peel the layers and get a bit deeper. So we are going to go through three conversations. There's going to be the first conversation on what does it take to build a great product? What does it take to build a great multinational company? And then we are going to get you to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing in terms of the trends that you're seeing. You do get around a lot in the world, so we hope to pick your brains on that. So before we dive into these, these three areas, Vlad, uh, can I request you to introduce yourself and Revolute a little bit? I, I'm sure your Revolute is not, uh, not known to this crowd. This is a FinTech crowd. But maybe you can add a little bit more nuance to what Revolute is all about. Sure. Thank, thank, thank you for the introduction. and. Uh... Thank you for having me uh, at this event. Uh, it's, uh, um, my, it's my first time in India. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and uh, maybe just uh, before, um, before uh, I maybe say anything about if I do audience check, can I ask you maybe raise your hand if you heard of Revolut before the previous session? OK, it's, uh, it's, it's decent. It's not the full audience, but, uh, but it's decent. Uh, part of it, I guess, is we haven't uh, launched in India yet. Um, but we are on, on the way uh, there. Uh, about Revolut, just in a nutshell, uh, we are a fintech headquartered in London uh, with presence uh, across pretty much the whole Europe, uh, US, Japan, Australia. Uh, a couple of other countries, uh, Brazil uh, recently, and uh, uh, we, uh, our ma main product in Europe is, is banking. Uh, we started from the roots of uh, effects and uh, cross-border payments uh, and, and travel card. That was kind of our initial product, and then kind of over time we scaled into offering more services uh, uh, from trading, credit, uh, and so on, uh, and different varieties of those. Um. Fantastic. I, I, it was intriguing, intriguing to see that there were, there were quite a few hands up there, but there were also quite a few hands which were not up there. So hopefully through this session, we can, um, we can really excite uh, the Indian ecosystem about um, the, the business and the product that you have built. Uh, Vlad, that brings me <clears throat> to the first step of starting a company. Before, before an entity becomes a company, you have to have a world-class product with a great product market fit, which, which consumers want to really use. And, and I must say that what you have built is truly remarkable. Uh, I think I, I admire it from outside as, as, uh, as, as a great accomplishment for Revolut. But could I pick your brain on how did you go about building a really fantastic product? What were some really difficult choices you made, how did they play out, and what has been your experience like in doing that? Sure. Maybe I'll start with a disclaimer. Uh, product market fit is not a solved problem. For yeah. It's not like you solve it once and, the, and you forget about it. It's something that we have to rediscover all the time. Uh, as, as we grow as a company, we go into new segments of customers, we introduce new products, uh, we have to, like I'll give you an example. Maybe uh, the uh, you know we started with a kind of more or less simple proposition that was solving specific problems around uh, sending money abroad, exchanging, and spending abroad. So three simple problems. We gave multi-currency accounts with multi-currency cards, 
right, and enabled uh, remittance. Um, then, as we started building, like building more product, etc., so we had to reinstate our how we package all of that in one application. You know, at some point, recently we started calling. As I guess some of it is the the trend of having a super app with a lot of functionality. That some of it wasn't even finance related. Uh, you know, there's a lot of affiliated products. Like uh, in Europe, we offer things like. Uh, hotel bookings, which are right in the app, um, uh, ins different type of insurances and so on. At some point, so there is this, uh, you know, when you have all these things together, it's super critical to, uh, like, to contain that complexity, right? For us, it's like one of the principles, how we build everything is we have to ensure it's simple from two aspects. From the customer perspective, how customer uses, can they discover the product? Uh, and from internal perspective, how do we manage to deliver that product? Is it efficient? Are the processes behind uh, coping with the, you know, with, with the growth of customers, uh, you know, the complexity that comes in our case also with you know, operating with many jurisdictions is the regulatory environment, which is uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, is, is different across the world, uh, and we have to adjust to that, right? And this is another piece that makes it, you know, this problem complex. That's why maybe it's not that many plays uh, in this space, but at the same time, for us, it's a challenge to ensure that for customers, it's, uh, uh, that experience is not, uh, like the friction that is caused by, you know, necessary, uh, Necessary friction related to again compliance, financial crime uh, controls, those things that are minimized uh, to such level that uh, customers don't don't feel it. It's it's a it's a continuous challenge. Uh, but as I said, for us, it's a key thing is to keep things simple, and it's it goes through the whole stack how we approach. Uh, it's from how we think about the products of first experience of the customers. Uh, designing that, the whole process itself of designing and all the way to, to the code that is later released uh, and you know, customers get to use the functionality, is uh, we ensure that we streamline all of that. Mm. It's one of the critical things uh, for us to be able, and one of the key things uh, kind of as we learned through, through our journey while going from one into one country and another. Uh, being able to replicate as much of the experience that we gained uh, in, in uh, our new products, uh, uh, new, new jurisdictions. And uh, that comes uh, on, on technical level. Uh, I'm not sure how technical the audience uh, is, but like in, uh, uh, on high level, um, we uh, built in-house 99% of our uh, technology is uh, in-house built. It's covering pretty much everything, you know, including each house system. That is uh, also, at some point, we decided wow. to build our own in-house because to to be able to, you know, facilitate our processes, how we design them and evolve them accordingly, instead of being, you know, people management is, is a critical yeah. uh, piece for us as a as a growing company now uh, with over uh, six thousand people globally uh, with uh, you know, challenges of working you know, in distributed environment as well, not just being in one country. So that, that, that's key. And uh, so it's in-house, uh, second is open source. Uh, we, we don't buy software. We, we do work with uh, SaaS vendors of, for, for certain areas, uh, but we prefer to build and deploy own code. Uh, and for each of the layers kind of, of the development process, as I was saying, from, uh, from designing the product uh, to f building it to uh, releasing it to collecting uh, data and analytics to be able to define what is going to be the next iteration of it, we approach it uh, with uh, standardization, single framework, for all of those things, uh, 
uh, single platform and organizationally we structured to support that so that across the company, different business units working on different products, they have, can have as much autonomy as possible, but at the same time, it's a lot of reuse of all those things, how to do things, right? so that we don't end up with uh, discrepancy across uh, our whole ecosystem of uh, you know, over a thousand different um, applications. Uh, that, that's, that's a key thing, right? Like for us to stay up to date, to be able to react to, to market customer needs. Uh, just as, as an example, uh, you know, for us, um, you know, no, notion of digital transformation, like it doesn't exist per se, how like in, in, in bigger old organizations where there is discrepancy of technology, um, the, uh, you know, those are big multi-year uh, programs usually for us. It's a, uh, uh, coming from a need, okay, we need to be, our stake has to be up to date. Uh, as an example, a simple example, if we need to uh, maintain the latest, so for example, one of the predominant technology we use is uh, Java. And uh, for us to leverage the, the latest version of it, we need to consi consistently upgrade all our stack, all our applications in Java in the shortest term. So this is how we approach. We don't leave it to individual teams to do that. We do it with very small efforts. In our case, it's a team of two people that is preparing everything and the upgrade happens within a matter of two, three months. With, while all the teams working on their products, etc., there is no big disruption, etc. So that, this is our typical approach on all uh, kind of uh, parts of our uh, architecture. D did you say 6,000 people globally? Uh, yeah, that's right. Wow! J I mean, just 6,000. To, to yeah, a lot of it, of course, is uh, uh, operational roles uh, within uh, financial crime, customer service. Yeah. So uh, the. Uh, People who are involved in product, uh, specifically, it's probably under 2,000 people. Yeah. yeah. I, I must say, Vlad, looks like you discovered something that Elon Musk discovered at X much later, which is you can do 3x more with one-third the people that, that, a, that a normal organization would require, or maybe even less. So I think fantastic. Getting 6,000 people to build a franchise of this quality is great. You, you made some really important points, which I, I think re should resonate a lot with builders in India, which is around keeping things simple, because otherwise creating scale is very hard. Um, then taking charge of the key assets, uh, your in-house, your open source, and you have really customized it to suit your processes, and you have set processes up to allow for a certain agility and, and simplicity. Um, can I ask you, how do you, how do you, attract, engage, develop the best technology talent in order to be able to do this. Because on the one hand, some of the best tech and engineering folks would want a free hand to be able to do a new innovation every day and, and try and run in different directions and hack a new problem. On the other hand, when you're building something which is standardized, which scales, reliable, highly regulated financial asset, it, it requires a certain discipline and process. So how do you really solve the talent uh, problem in all of this? This is a challenge, uh, I think, for, for most of companies. Uh, uh, it's <laughs> a key thing to, to, yeah. to look at all the time. Uh, for us, it's important that, uh, uh, yes, we have the best talent. Uh, we have an advantage, in a way, with uh, our uh, w location, working location policies where we are completely flexible. Uh, as long as we can hide in the country, the person can be anywhere pretty much. Yeah. Um, so which kind of for us, it uh, opens, you know, the, the, the surface is much larger in that case, especially when COVID started, that was, we leveraged that a lot. Um, right. Where company, grew, during that time, company grew significantly while people never met each other in person uh, until maybe some later when travel already was possible. Uh, that and uh, in other aspects, we, we realize that, uh, I mean, we, we're looking for traits, fundamentally. We look for 
for fundamentals in terms of knowledge, whatever the person is specializing in, mm. uh, and um, um, uh, ability to learn. Ability to learn, uh, having initiative, you know, the, the, the work ethics, uh, that are the, the key things I would say. Uh, so they, what I would call culture fit, uh, it's a critical stage in our interview process as well. Um, that part itself, the, the, you know, how we interview, it's uh, not also left like individually to each team to do it. Uh, like we have a, a system across the company which is then specialized for different roles, etc. There are owners for these processes in, from interviewing, uh, uh, onboarding, etc. and so on. So uh, I can't say we're, we're perfect in that area. There's uh, continuous work. But uh, it's, it's, I would say it's something that has to be uh, looked at all the time. Talent management is, is, uh, is key. Yeah. But I, I think you, you, you said something really key to the issue of being able to attract and groom and retain great talent, which is to hire for a certain fit. Uh, and, and it's great. I mean, obviously, you, all the things that you said, which is about you should be good at technology if you're being hired for technology and so on, but also work ethic and do you really fit into the overall ethos. I think that, that actually is a key point and uh, potentially something very useful for uh, builders in India and, and founders in India who are building companies. If I stay on the theme of the product a little bit, you spoke about customer experience and then going down all the stack, all the way through the stack to getting the right processes and then the right technology and then the data and then going through an iterative route to keep getting it better. Um, as you were building these, what were are there some moments that you felt, aha, I mean, this, this really is something I didn't expect, or this is really something that is very important and is, imp is critical to build a great product or a great digital asset? Um, or were there moments where you felt, this is really hard, I made a mistake, this is the wrong way to go, and we should avoid going down this path? It's, it, it, hindsight is always uh, you know, the better side, but... Uh, um, it's, uh, I think one of the again, strength maybe in, in, in our uh, company ethos is the uh, adaptability, right? It's like the, the things I mentioned before uh, that help us to, to, to adapt, adapt to situation, especially you know, if we consider the, the things that happened in the market in, in the last year alone, uh, f globally, uh, you know, from banks collapsing, yeah. Crypto firms, it's, uh, all of these things, they happened, uh, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, all of those things had big impacts uh, on us as well. Um, so for us to go through those challenges, uh, you know, was, it's, it's important to, to be able to, to adjust quickly. Uh, like risk management is, again, another key mm. thing like for, mm. for anyone who, who is in financial industry and uh, people would understand that. Um, Maybe part, part of the, maybe uh, one of the lessons maybe is uh, uh, the, uh, within the you know, regulatory environment, uh, especially a certain way how financial institutions should operate, it's kind of, it's already designed by sort of regulators, right? Um, for us, what is important to kind of realize uh, at some point, I wish we realized that later and figured out maybe, maybe it was more even, figuring out how to do it, how we can integrate the, all the three lines in such a way, or more, most importantly, the, the two lines, the first line of defense, the second line of defense, mm. in such a way, mm. so that they can operate uh, and um, so not, not be uh, <coughs> against each other, how it often happens in some organizations, and. Uh, but to work together because the, the goal is, is common, to create the, the best product, the compliant product, the uh, secure product, uh, solve problem for customers. Right? Um, the, the motivation is the same, and also the, the challenge is how to, how to make this uh, work together. We, we integrate the, the risk management part into product management. Uh, wow. Okay. So that that's that's key uh, thing. Uh, it's not like uh, enough 
I thought it was it was challenging. Like in the beginning, it wasn't it wasn't working very smoothly. Correct. But it's kind of going through iterations because um, uh, it's learning from from both sides, especially people who come from you know, backgrounds where they're sort of uh, used to just be you know, if it's second line on kind of being a barrier. Yeah. Business of business being kind of treating it as a yeah. as a, it's a hurdle. Yeah. Uh, so that breaking that. You know, uh, making each side learn the other side, uh, you know, there's, uh, in our case, the, from uh, from business side, there is constant feedback into how the uh, risk process is, how the framework uh, works, uh, accordingly back into product from, from risk, there's uh, a lot of feedback uh, training that is happening so that product can actually understand better how to manage uh, on risks and so on. So That's really fascinating. And I, th I think it's a sign of the, the maturity that overall in the, in the FinTech and the new ecosystem that's happening, this conversation about risk management is, is so central. Um, we talk quite often about this notion of compliance by design and not an afterthought. Once you have built something, then you then you wake up and think, hey, is this compliant? Versus as you're building it, really asking yourself, is this compliant? And a, a fascinating and, and a more recent anecdote, I was there in the other room uh, with, a, with the Matrix Partners track, and one of the other very senior founders in the eco Indian ecosystem said, I do something really simple. I imagine that the regulator has downloaded my app and, and has started using it. So just as you would imagine a customer downloading your product and using it, you also imagine a regulator using it, and just that mind frame gets you really alert about what would be the first reaction, what would be the second reaction, and then you start thinking a bit differently. So I, I think it's a great lesson for, for everyone uh, and, a, and a sign of Absolutely. great maturity. So um, let me shift gears a little bit from the product towards building a multinational company, and I must say there are so many aspiring players, uh, new age players who want to cross borders, and there is often an intuition that technology can kind of scale borders very easily, data science can scale borders very easily, even if the regulatory environment and regime is different. Uh, but it's easier said than done. And I think you in Revolut have really, really done that more successfully than many others. So what has, what has been the magic sauce? How have you really thought about internationalization while maintaining the right local balance? And, and how did you make this happen? It starts with the problem, understanding the problem really well, what is the actual requirement, why it exists, putting that into context. Second step is to, for us, and this is how I push to think, you know, product, engineering, operations, everyone who's involved in define, defining, deciding, you know, uh, anything, is to think uh, with framework in mind. Mm. Because almost always, like most of problems, they are not a single instance, not one of them. How we can do it in such ways, so we right, introduce the frameworking. This, yes. a framework for it, so we can actually then do it again uh, easily. Right? So we, we don't just solve it, you know, once off and, you know, uh, what, what I mentioned it might be earlier, like the, the, the framework platform approach, uh, which at the same time gives autonomy to different teams uh, where it's needed. Like where teams within a you know, specific market, they, they own the market, they, the important part for them is to be able to reach the customer, to create the, the message, to understand the, the needs, what specifically needs to be right. localized, uh, deliver it to teams that build it, Right. Uh, and the way we approach it as well, again, we, we had a lot of learnings uh, over the years because we started uh, expanding outside of Europe first time in uh, our first approach was 2018. Uh, not my initial things were sort of very startup y, let's just do it and yeah. see you know, what happens. Uh, there was a lot of learning from that, and kind of we realized, okay, we have to have more structured approach. Uh, one of the things we do, like the challenge we had, for example, with 
local teams getting requirements when we have centrally built platform having the uh, kind of the central human capital that is then you know demanded across the world was a challenge right how we solve it currently we create local hubs but we don't do it when approach again my, my as well approach to to scaling is not to build straight away for you know for the absolute scale but to do it what gradually right like in this case we don't create a team per country we have regional hubs where they work with you know within one of the because one of the main challenges is uh, collaboration and it's not even the location that is critical but the time so people are in close time zones they can ah, yes, work together yes. this is one key thing that was important for us to solve and they know like you know what we define them local hubs, regional development hubs. Uh, we have one in Latin America, another one is uh, in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, focusing on on these markets. Wow. Okay. Uh, this is this is remarkable. I have not. Honestly, I think this is very unique because what you have you are doing is you're creating local hubs in certain time zones. And that hub has the technology and talent density to be able to solve the problems in that area. I think the second thing you said is that don't go and build it for the ultimate scale right away. Build it incrementally because there is a lot of learning that you learn and that comes along the way. And you spoke about this, this thing I want to get a bit deeper into. You spoke about don't solve it uh, idiosyncratically for just one odd market. Think of a problem as a framework and then kind of create a structure. Can you give me a little more color on that or some example, some way of thinking about it? Because I'm sure there are a lot of founders who are trying to go international and they're going to go through this experience of framework, frameworking the problem and making it more generic. So how, how do you really do this? What does it mean? And th this probably uh, aligned with the previous question, things that I wish I did earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if that thinking about, you know, communicating to everyone the importance of streamlining and simplifying. It's like, I'll give you an example. Um, for, uh, we use a lot of machine learning. Uh, data scientists is one of the key roles that we hire for. And uh, the, the, this space in itself is still not mature. Yeah, it's fairly new. It derives from computer science more generally, but it, this certain specialization and the industry itself is not mature yet. The practices, the tooling, everything is, you know, we, you know, the people who come to the company, they learn how to use that. They come up with own ways to do it. So in the beginning, it creates, you know, people come with very different ideas how to do this. There's no where, you know, one best way or standard defined for that. Uh, and we had a problem that uh, managing those models, and it's because it's a complex process, it's a more complex process right. Than, right. than writing soft software. Uh, right. That in itself created a lot of complexity. Right? Then we decided, okay, this, this becomes too complex. Uh, the, the knowledge gets lost sometimes. Um, we decided to create our own uh, machine learning platform to manage mm -hmm. the whole process to, and to simplify the work from mm -hmm. for data scientists. And this is kind of a, a problem in the industry that is very, very well known that data scientists, 90% of their time, they're doing software engineering. Right? That's a big problem. Like we realized it as well. And like the way we approach to build this because some engineers focus on building the platform for data scientists to work on their models. Right. Focus on where the 80% of their time, they just work on the models instead of figuring out how to, how to deploy it, how to run it, right. how to train it, how to connect it to data, all those things. It's, it's, it's a platform problem. And, and this kind of thinking is your day job, right? This is really what you... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just this? me, uh, of course. It's, uh, you know, the, uh, all, all the team, uh, like, but 
what, what I put kind of in, in places fundamentally where we have these kind of uh, problems, we have platform teams. Right. Oh, uh, I see. This is uh, specifically <coughs> platform teams that are not focused on end product, but uh, facilitating all the products. And it's, these platform teams, they are the central technology platform teams for all the stack, for all our backend, machine learning, data platform, uh, design system is a big part of it. Uh, it's for, because for us, it's critical every time we make changes so that that uh, experience in the application across uh, iOS, Android, web is exactly the same. Right. When we make a change, we, when we you know, decided to rebrand, we don't want to spend a lot of time going through all the different assets, each team independently, and then fixing lots of inconsistencies. We create a design system with uh, a big part of our whole uh, approach is automation as well, as much as possible. Right, so right. So information that we feed at the top of the funnel, most of it should sync automatically right. down the stream through you know, what designers put. They made the decisions on how the UI should look like that automatically goes into code. The framework developers, they don't have to think that about that anymore. Right. Did they pick the right color and so on? Did they so those discrepancies those in the past was a big uh, problem. We solved it with, uh, you know, again, framework, which is design system, automation around that. Um, that was how we approach, uh, so because India as a market is very unique. Uh, in the previous session, there was a mention of data localization requirements. Uh, that was uh, another challenge for us to solve, but fundamentally, Again, we leveraged a lot of those things that we defined as frameworks right, through automation. Um, maybe another example I would give is um, it's one of the problems for many uh, financial institutions of certain size is managing your whole uh, ecosystem, doing audits on it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Quite often, these are heavy processes. Yeah. For us, it was critical to build uh, a governance system on top, which is not just a set of policies. Those are policies, frameworks, that are coded into system from which the most of things are automated. Controls that have to be put in place, because one of the key issues to, yep. to be operationally efficient, you, to be able to manage your risk, to know that you have your controls. You need to have completeness. You need to have 100%. There is no such thing. 90% you know, will, will be fine. It's fantastic. Right. I think this is really getting to the, at least for me, getting to the magic sauce of it, which is a lot of these structural problems have to, solve, have to be solved in the substrate layer. It's not the customer facing. It's really the underlying, which is fantastic. I think just in the last few minutes, I want to um, tap into your, um, your role and your vantage point as someone who goes around the world quite a bit. Uh, what are some of the big trends you are seeing? Now, I, I know for a, I, I picked, up, picked this up in a conversation that you don't really look at yourself, quote, quote unquote, as a neo bank, but you're really essentially a digital first bank. Uh, in some markets, Europe, you're actually a fully regulated entity, so you are licensed, you are mainstream, front and center. Um, then there's this whole notion about super app versus not. So, what are some of the big trends you are seeing play out that we should all be watching out for? I think the, the trend of digitalization is uh, kind of outdated. Yeah. <laughs> right? We we see uh, you know the uh, the pandemic accelerated that massively. Um, uh, but of course, it's like it's a, it's more of a necessity for the whole industry. Uh, FinTechs pushed the the legacy banks to move more into online digital. You know, and in Europe specifically, you know the. In uh, 2019, 2020, those were in the news for those, some of the common taglines, uh, headlines about banks closing branch in here and there across yeah. countries. Uh, so we kind of, that is already happening or happened. Uh, the other thing, one specific thing maybe I'm excited specifically about is um, uh, open banking. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, you know, it was a uh, uh, regulatory initiative in Europe. Uh, it's spreading 
across the world, uh, many regulators realized okay, these big benefit in it. This challenge in making it work technically, because there's uh, within one country maybe it's it's, it's a much smaller issue within environment like uh, European Union with every country left to it's own device hard. how to define the standards how exactly to do it which created its own industry of aggregators um, uh, but gen generally that's uh, like the, the direction itself from my perspective is great because it's uh, we see it gives customers better choice yeah uh, transparency uh, on you know Things like uh, you know, service availability, mm. uh, switching providers. You don't like the, the decision uh, like before switching schemes. For example, in, in the UK, existed and that required a you know, very hard decision. It's all or nothing. You yeah. either change your bank fully or yeah. not at all. And yeah. it's of course less than one percent of population you know would make such decision yeah. in their life. Absolutely. And Open banking simplify that that you, as a consumer, can benefit. You know, you don't have to make this hard decision to be just with one provider. Uh, you can connect your accounts easier. You can, uh, you know, in some uh, standards, they define even things like transparency on pricing, right? Which is fed through the uh, open banking API and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, no, makes a lot of sense, Vlad. I think you are obviously a great proponent of open banking and the benefits of that for the consumer. Um, uh, in India and in uh, a bunch of other Asian economies, that's an area of focus where regulations are evolving. So I think point well made and well taken. We, uh, we'd love to go on, but I, the organizers are keeping us honest on time. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm, if it's okay, I'll skip the Q&A, but uh, Vlad and Paroma are around. If there are more questions, uh, Please do catch them. Uh, thank you so much, and enjoy your lunch after this. Vlad, thank you so much for coming down to India. This is your first visit, but hopefully, first visit, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, so ho hopefully you come back quite often, and we'd love to host you again. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just uh, on a final note, a big congratulations uh, to, to, to the whole Indian nation for the you know, incredible launch on the moon. Uh, that, that was amazing. <laughs> congratulations.